Okay, hi to everybody out there. Good evening from Berlin. And you can probably see on the Google Hangout box, I have not one guest with me, but two guests from, from Chicago, Gail Williams and Michael Mulcahy. Oh, I think it's you down there, hanging out down the end of the... Hi, Mike. Hi, Gail. Hi, Welcome. Hi, yeah. hi, hi all world. <laughs> Greetings from Chicago. So your teaching room is right next door to Gail's, right? Exactly. We're at Northwestern. And uh, Gail's been here for how many years? Many. And I've been here for not quite so many. I've been here so, for about 12. So Gail, when you started in the orchestra, Mike wasn't there yet, was he? No. Mm -mm. How, many, how, how long were you there before he, he showed up? What was your I, start I started year? in 78. Yeah. yeah, I started in 89, so 11 years later. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so you were a part of his committee, huh? So you were the, one of the people. I actually was, yeah. We don't know how she voted, but she was there. <laughs> how did you vote, Gail? Voting, was strictly confidential. That's correct. <clears throat> it cost me a fortune to get that job. <laughs> I bet it did. And so you just, Gail, when did you actually leave the orchestra exactly? In 98, in okay. August. Mike, do you miss her terribly? Uh, absolutely, oh. but oh. We, we see a lot of each other because we play in Chicago Chan Musicians. Yeah. Uh, which is a which is the leading chamber music organization in the city here in Chicago, and we also spend the summers in Wyoming at the Grand Teton Music Festival, which is one of I the great of the hikers hiker community. Oh yeah. yes, yeah, we love mountains. Yeah, uh, we we, exactly. we that keeps us going every year. That's where we refresh and regenerate. It's great. It's like you, you don't have you don't you don't lose your chops because you're playing all the time, so you don't have to worry about you know getting yes. out of shape. And you That's get correct. in shape with, with, with hiking and everything. You come back from the mountains at altitude and you feel like God for at least a day. <laughs> at least a day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Mike, tell, just tell us a bit of the insider. I know you've got to teach in a say. Tell us about a bit of the insider information about Gail as principal horn. I mean, I, she, she's been my idol for as long as I've been playing the horn. But, I mean, you had this sort of little gal sitting in front of you pumping in air, it, it must have been amazing. Yeah, I, I, and I, I mean, there are not many people that have spent more time sitting behind Gail than Probably me. Probably not, that's we absolutely have, true. You know. <laughs> and more ways than one. I know her from behind, better than her husband does. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, there, there are a few joys. One of them is that she's always musically motivated primarily and like myself she's always trying to understand what is the composer asking for you know there are the one of the problems we have in brass playing is that there are some really great players and some really great teachers but frequently the exponents of that particular style of playing impose a way of playing the instrument on the music so I'm a great horn player. This is the way I play the horn. And I, now me, I'm going to play me doing Mahler and now me doing Mozart, me doing Strauss, and it all pretty much sounds the same. Gail does not think like that. I don't either. I think that the instrument is just a vehicle. You, you, try, to, you try to refine and simplify your instrument, but it's only reflective of what you're conceiving musically. And so that has to be imposed on the instrument. You can't impose the instrument on the music. So that's that's the first thing. Secondly, she's an extremely correct player. She has great setting. You see, brass players always have this diamond here. Show diamond. Show us in the camera. Yeah, she's got the corners. Give yeah. us a pucker. <laughs> Flat chin, nice, nice yep. firm corners, and staying set through the whole phrase and blowing in single waves. So all the stuff... You're always sitting behind her. You're always sitting behind her. How could you see that? Well, sometimes we're playing smaller chamber music and I see her from the front as well. Yes. Miss Facetious. Uh, so, yeah. So the stuff that I teach and the stuff that I try to execute is, 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 is manifested in Gail's playing. So at any point, I can tell my students, you need to stay set during, let's say, the opening of Hedleland. That's something that many people can feel they have 30 embouchures for. But if they are aware of setting and uh, 
parallel air engagement with their embouchure setting, then it can sound stable and the color is the same and you can get fluency and economy. Yeah. So there you go. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. Mike, I think we're going to have to have you back for your own session, if you wouldn't mind, sometime. Got, and then we'll, that would be just incredible because this thing, what, what Tim and Jeff are setting up in Melbourne is incredible. You know, this, this whole, it's a whole different world for the brass players out there. And we have huge plans. Yeah, and um, I'll be telling you, to you guys some more about that, but maybe not quite yeah. when we're online with hundreds yeah. and hundreds of drum players. Hi, guys. That's good. <laughs> Great to see you, Sarah. Nice to see you too. Thanks so much for coming yeah. by. Yeah, Jeff owes me an email. And, uh, and, and uh, be patient, everyone. Do, do good work. We'll Thanks. get it sorted. We'll get you back on very soon, Mike. Take care. Okay. Bye. 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 Thanks for coming. Good. Oh, good for your feet. That was fantastic. What a treat. But it's such a treat to have you here too. We have people all over the place. It's really incredible where everyone's watching from. Um, yeah, I'll send, I'll, I'll send you a, a list of where everyone's watching from when you when we finish this. You can't see the chat, can you? No, probably not. Oh, it's it's really incredible. But um, tell me, I just want to ask you some more about the orchestra because last time we had you on a couple of weeks ago and the famous echoes. Echoes, the echoes right? <laughs> the echoes were just the best. I love them. And um, we couldn't get you on visual, but you said so much amazing stuff. And after you'd gone offline. I asked the, the viewers what they wanted to know um, from you about uh, the next time. And apart from all the technical stuff, now we'll get them all um, asking you their questions again in a bit, because that's, that's part of what, what we're doing is um, they, they're writing in on the chat. But a lot of people wanted to know about your early days in the orchestra. Um, so, I mean, it was, that's why it's so interesting to hear from Mike about, about, um, about the, the great things that, that you do in the orchestra. I mean, I sat behind you as well when I was there. Um, but. Uh, but uh, but when you joined, you were you were a little young thing, and you'd come you come from a farm. <laughs> well, I had I had done um, my undergraduate in a small school uh, in music education, not performance. I had not studied horn until I got to college, and um, and I came to Northwestern to get my master's. So I might be lucky enough to teach in a in a small college. Never expecting to know what I was gonna gonna happen, yeah. and I was extremely fortunate to get into lyric opera. So I played in lyric opera for four years, um, and that was a huge part of my education. Opera is just so. I I started an opera orchestra too. It just I think everyone should start in an opera orchestra. It's yeah, incredible. the first opera I got to play uh, was Goddard Emmerung as an extra player in '74, and I was playing first Wagner tuba. And the soprano came in and buried the orchestra. Oh no! And you're getting Nielsen. <laughs> wow. And then I realized what a shaft of light right over your head, you know, can be like. It was fantastic, and I learned so much of of, of endurance from playing an opera. You know, you can learn a lot from playing long tones in a lot from. Playing uh, in brass quintet, and but you never know what it's really like until you've played the whole opera of Meister Singer. It's not only the, the the endurance here; it's the the mental endurance as well. Because the to keep endurance. concentrating for five hours, you really have to know how to pace it. Yeah. How many bananas you have to eat in the interval and stuff like that. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, so that really helps a lot. And uh, then I joined the orchestra in 78 um, as assistant in utility. And then in 84, I was moved over to associate and was there the until I left. The rest is history. Yeah. yeah. The rest is history. That's correct. Did you, did you, could you always breathe so amazingly well? Because I've sat next to you, I've sat behind you, I've watched you fill up, you use every centimeter of spare space in there um, and admire. Could you always do that or was that something you sort of cultivated when you came to Chicago Symphony? Uh, I think my first horn teacher really encouraged me. Um, but then I, when I immediately came here I started taking lessons with Arnold Jacobs. And the first lesson, I remember, you know, he has all these machines all over the place and, and he has you get your lungs measured and 
And <clears throat> he's saying, now take a big breath and breathe into this machine. And so I took a breath and exhaled. He said, no, 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 my dear, you're doing this all wrong. Oh. You got to take a really big breath and exhale. So I took another big breath and exhale. He says, no, 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 my dear, you're doing this all wrong. And uh, so about after three or four times, he said, well, you know what? We have something in common. I have 2.5 liters of air, and so do you, and I play the tuba. So it doesn't make any difference what you have is what you do with it. 2.5 liters of air. You have yeah. 2.5 liters of air. When yeah. I think of Stefan well, Boyd, he has five point something. You know, these yeah, guys. I, had a, I had a student in here the other day who's a nice young man, and I said, do you have any idea what your lung capacity is? And he said, yeah, it's 7.5. Oh, so I can all the girl, all the girl horn players out there watching are going, oh no, because that's a real it doesn't, problem. But that doesn't make any difference. He still wasn't oh. taking a very good breath, yeah. you know. So yeah. it doesn't make any difference what you have is how you release it. So if you're in a, any kind of tension, it's not going to be very efficient, and that's so Jake, what Jake would make you breathe in, and 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 how did he encourage you to breathe out without tension? I mean, I, I I never met him. I only had a phone conversation with him when I was in Chicago with you guys all those years ago. Um, he was not feeling very well, and he wasn't teaching yeah. anymore. But I had a great conversation with him on the phone. I'll always be very sorry about that. But yeah. um, how? What are what were his methods to really stop the tension going out, especially in a smaller person? He would all the, the one thing that I can say, and this is hard because you know, it's, if you don't have a person here doing it, you can't help them. But he he would say, if you would take a um, bow, and he would always put it on your arm and go and pull it across, and he said, now go, and if you just do that, you realize how compressed you are. And he said, you don't want to hear string players play with that kind of pressed sound, so you shouldn't do it on a wind instrument either. Okay. And, but so his, his response was how you release the air and to let it continue, and when you're taking another breath, no one should ever hear it. Yeah. And no I would sit behind him and watch him breathe, and I would close my eyes and I couldn't figure out when he took a breath. You hear a lot of people breathing, especially the girls, you hear this little sort of, this sort of shadow. Yeah, breathing. yeah. That's how, right. How, and how can they he, avoid that? They have to think about saying more, I think I said a, a couple weeks ago, suck air in over your bottom lip. So it may not be a total way underneath, but if you, um, ah. Ah. I, I, rem I was looking in here something the other day. And this is something he would use, and this is something that Eddie Kleinhammer used. And it's a piece of tubing. Okay. And so if you practice with this, and I have it so I can put it in my hand. Yeah. So I can take a breath, pick up my horn, and go. And Mr. Kleinhammer would have it tied around his neck and take a big breath and pick up his trombone and play. He would do that, did it for 40 years. We can't actually breathe in through our mouthpieces because it's got such a small opening. Right, like the tube. Well, right. so you, you can't breathe, and I think that's what you hear a lot. You hear the suction right around the mouthpiece. Yeah. yeah. And I, Everybody's set up differently, their face and their lips and everything. I think the main thing is I think they're already thinking about the articulation and the tongue is too high. So if you just thought about keeping your tongue low, it's going to be a, a more round uh, inhale. Are there people that do this naturally? And if someone's doing it wrong, how is it really possible for them to totally change what they do? Because I, I, I hear at master classes all over the world, people really struggle with this. They go, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and their well, tongue is you know, and the, the shoulders go up and you, you see the tension in the throat. That's right. Yeah, and uh, there's all kinds of tricks you can try doing, but until they actually hear it themselves, they can't change. And that's the main thing. They don't hear it. And they don't take, they don't take the time to practice slow enough so they can get the idea of getting a breath, slow breath in or a good breath in. And then you can start adding that. So you have to break the cycle somewhere. 
So what about this sort of the, the Char when I when I met Charlie for the first time? He, it was exactly the same as with you and Jake. Charlie said, "Breathe in." So I breathed in as deep as I could, and I was totally full. And he said, "Did you breathe yet?" You know, I was. <laughs> he, I hadn't taken nearly enough, and he he does it sort of, this sort of sucking in sucking in the air. That makes quite a noise, though. It makes quite a noise. There's another exercise that uh, a teacher down in Texas teaches. And that is to, you know, you take a big breath and you exhale your arm up, exhale your arm up, and when you're, you know, when you're out of air, you drop your arm in relax motion and you take a breath because you do it all day. So if you go, and you breathe in when the arm goes down. Can we yeah. do that? Come on, everybody. We're going to do this all around the world. We're going to breathe in. Breathe Take in. A breath. Yeah. Exhale. And you probably put in quite a bit a lot of air. You know, and it's 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 with no tension. And I did it in a class once with about thirty people, well about three hundred brass players. And I said, So what did you hear? And one of the, an older gentleman said, It's the quietest inhale I've ever heard. <laughs> it's really because incredible. it's relaxed. It's relaxed and it doesn't have tension. And that's what Jake would talk about a lot is if you take in relaxed air, you can blow with efficient relaxed air as an exhale. But if you take in with tension going in, it's got to turn around and be the same. Okay, so to summarize, you would say to take in, you take in air over the bottom lip. You, 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 not, you would not um, to keep the tongue down while you take in air. And you, we try and make it as quiet as possible. Right. I mean, you have brass players, tubas, and trombones really making a hell of a noise behind us. Um, uh, and maybe they need it. They need to get more, more in, and they have to get it out faster than we do, I guess. Um, the flow but is but the, the flow is faster. Is there something that people, sometimes I have the feeling when people are playing for me, um, that they don't have, they can't visualize the air going. They'll go, uh, they'll go, ba da ba da ba da ba da ba. They can't visualize the air going like a laser. Do you have anything that you use to help them visualize how the air is is moving? <clears throat> um, I'm looking in my studio. Where's my? <laughs> air? Oh, there is. Well, I will be I'll right. Tell, I'll tell the viewers now. This is Gail's studio at Northwestern, and these very handsome fellows on the walls behind her are her. Her two dogs, I'm going to find out the names in a minute, I completely forgot. Um, and, uh, oh, what are the names of your dogs, Gail? Greta and Riley. Which one's which? Riley's the big one, looking straight at us. This one's Riley, he's 10, and my little, little girl is Greta, and she's three, and she's a pain. Okay. <laughs> but I love her. Okay. Show us what you got. This is, a, this is called a... Inspiron or Inspirex or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And I use it mainly blowing with a mouthpiece. Okay. Keeping the ball up there. And it I and I don't know what else to say. I say it's the wrong kind of air when you are blowing into this and the ball doesn't stay up. You okay. can't see it. And the ball doesn't no, stay up here. I, 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 the ball has to stay up, what, like a like one of those. Um, is it what is it? A gumball machine or something? The the or what is keeps those? Yeah. You see the ball go up and down. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's one of these things that has been that Jake got me using years ago, and it's been one of my best teachers. Do you still because use it? It's in front of you. Oh, every day. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm playing something really soft. Like, let's say, the opening of the second movement of the Brahms horn trio. And it's not quite the, the sound that I'm looking for. I, I get this out and put it very low and go, oh, well, the ball's not moving. And I buzz into it. I use my mouthpiece upside down. So okay, that's that how works. I would. Yeah. So I'll buzz into my mouthpiece into this, and the ball has to stay up. Now, of course, it has to go up and down for the phrasing. But you can see when you start articulating, if the ball doesn't move, your tongue is probably getting in the way. It's, 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 it's interesting because most people get on it and go, oh. And that's what they, oh. That's, oh, yeah. Gee, what happened? The ball's not moving. Where can you get these things? 
Um, I get mine from Brian Fredrickson, Winsong Press. Oh, yeah, okay, well. with, uh, many master classes with Arnold Jacobs. You can go online, find it, uh, Win Song Press, and you can actually go and see some videos of Arnold on there. He's on, on YouTube doing some of this stuff too, yeah. isn't he? And you can go on Win Song Press and I think I believe and see some of the YouTubes, yeah. Oh, incredible guy. I would have really given anything to have met him. It was it was you know, I would go into him and he would say to me uh, fine, this is much better. Now, tonight, don't use it. Because I would take a lesson, even when I was in, you know, in the orchestra, on Saturday morning. And he would say, I don't want to see you using this tonight. This is for you to go home and practice for six months. That's very important for students as well. I, I, when they come in with a problem, we work on it. And I say, OK, now, when you, when you have to play, you just play. But yep. when you're working, you work on correcting this. Right. I'm, I have said that. That's, that's it's 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 important because you have to survive. You have to play your ensembles, but you want to continue getting better. So then you have to practice that, and and you know it's a new habit, and the new habits are going to be not as strong as the old habits that are going to stay right there yeah. until the new habit can, smashes them down. You know. We've got some and then great six months later, they say, "Oh, I did the same thing." I said, "Yeah, the old habit's still there. It doesn't go anywhere." Absolutely. We've got some um, very helpful horn players who are now putting up the links um, for, for the Winsong Press out there. So that's really great. Thanks, guys, for joining in like that. How is your daily practice routine different or similar now compared to when you were at the CSO, asked Jonas Toms. Uh, well, that's very different because in the CSO, I was always in the same spot underneath the stage warming up with the same exercises along with Norman Schweikert. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had my routine and he had his, you know, and and you found out what works and what doesn't work and what you have to practice and it would vary depending on what you had to play. And That's now, good very yeah. good point too, because I mean, I, I there are a few things I do really every day, but I, I hate these sort of things, you have to do the same hour of stuff every day, depends on what you've got on that day, you know. That's I correct. do a tiring warm up if you're playing Helden Laden. That's right. Why, why do any long tones if you're playing Bruckner 7? You're going to be doing that. Absolutely. But if you have to play Mozart the next week, then you have to practice differently. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's what I, I always think. You have to practice almost the opposites. So you and, would warm up with Norm together? In the, in, yeah, the, there were four of us that were always warming up in orchestra hall at the same time underneath the stage. And it would be Eddie Kleinhammer on bass trombone, Norman Schweikert, and Tim Kent, trumpet player, and myself. And, you know, we good morning, and just then we were going on our own. But it was always the same four people. And if someone else walked in there, we'd kind of look at them like, excuse me? <laughs> this, is, this is our place, you know? But you, sort of all, you, you knew what, what keys everyone else was going to be in. So, so it was sort Well, of with like, Normans, you knew what time it was when he was on a certain <laughs> exercise. And at 9.35, he was walking up the stairs because you knew exactly what time he was going upstairs. But that's good. I mean, that's that. whether you do the same routine or vary it, you are doing the basics of the horn. And, and whether, now, you it, whether you call it a warm-up or is it your daily practice, who cares? It's, it's a routine that you need to do as a person and organize your life so you know where you are. Yeah. And everybody's, you know, my husband would complain, he's a clarinetist, and, and he would complain, oh, my reeds don't work today. And I'd say, oh, that's too bad. Aren't they lucky to have reeds? I say, I have the same lips and they don't work today either, so I just have to, who am I oh, going to take it? No. A knife and scrape off part of them? No. no. <laughs> so everybody, it just has, it's every day. What do I do now as I'm teaching? I'm finding that I do a lot of basics because when students don't come in and haven't done them, I get to do them again <laughs> all day long. And your basics are, I mean, we all probably say the same things, but just tell, tell all our, our friends well, out you there. Have to, you have to cover the range. You have to cover slurs. Uh, what's your weakest area? I go to that first. Uh, which is? What's your weakest area? My, my area is my break area, which is middle C, unfortunately. And so I know what doodles I have to do there, and I do lots of... Um, well, I vary it. 
That's quite high for a break, isn't it? Yeah. Middle it, yeah. There's, you know, not third space, but middle C. Yeah. Bummer. <laughs> but you just make the bridge bigger, you know? So you have a larger bridge and you have to always work at it. And, um, you know, slurs articulation. You can go through any warm ups. You could do James Stamp warm up. You can do the Dufran warm up. There's you know, so many of them, but, uh, you know. Do you think do you think st students should actually make up their own warm ups? I mean, I I'm a great uh, advocate of people taking lots of things from great horn players and putting it together in a program that suits you rather than you know doing one method every day. Yes, I think that's important for them to find out what works for them, yeah. because everybody is of uh, different muscle tissue and you are maybe a little bit less flexible than someone else. And maybe you need to do long tones three times a week and not two times a week. Or, yeah. Long tones. I've always hated long tones. Sorry, I shouldn't say that live on mine, but I do. <laughs> no, be done. Have, yeah, they, but they have to be done. I mean, it's embarrassing when you have to play the, um, the octaves of uh, concert B flat between the second and third movements of the Beethoven fifth piano concerto. And all of a sudden, your octaves are doing this, and they're not... That's oh, a long, a long tone like that. Long tones, don't, they don't have to be loud. They can be very soft for 30 seconds. What about crescendo diminuendos? Yeah, sure. You know, or, or start loud, go soft. Yeah, yeah that's almost harder. Yeah. yeah. Here we have, it's totally crazy, the chat at the moment. People are writing in all over the place for questions for you. So if I may ask you a few. Yep. Um, so, uh, Kendall Betts, who I think you know, maybe. Yes. Um, okay. I actually did not learn to breathe properly until I've had the pleasure of knowing Doc Severinsen. He advocated sipping the air and using an athletic motion with the abdominal muscles, both inhaling and praying to produce what he called pure pressure compression. I see that wouldn't really work for me at all, but um, maybe it's different for the guys. What do you think? I think it's different for everybody because they're different, you know, uh, if you're long-waisted or short-waisted. I think yeah. it's all very different. And Doc Severinsen also... Uh, played in a range that most people will never ever touch. <laughs> That's true. I certainly won't. <laughs> Not in my career. Um, uh, Emma asks, since breathing is so important, what if you have asthma? And being very small for a warm player, I take big breaths very often. Yeah, so do I. So do you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm fortunate that I've never had to deal with asthma, but um, I know that uh, habit forming of taking the biggest breath possible all the time will be the best thing you can do. And exhaling it, you can't, your body can't you take it. Hold it. You've got to get rid of it. Yeah. Okay. As Mr. Jacobs used to say, waste it. It's free. <laughs> That's now it's free. Yeah. So take it in and waste it because it won't. You don't have to hold it. I think that's going to become my mantra. Waste the air, it's free. It's fabulous. Fantastic. Couldn't be better. Um, so what else have we got here? Someone wanted to know um, uh, what, what are, the, what are the, the biggest challenges facing students today? Good question. Getting jobs, probably. <laughs> well, if, if depending, deciding what they want to do with their life, which most of them will, won't know for a while because they're yeah. too young and they shouldn't know. Um, getting a job and realizing that it's, it's hard work. And it's not just talent. It's how much time you sit there and practice your basics. Because it's all the same notes. They're just in a different order. Do you and find so you students, can, students in general have problems with one particular thing? I mean, I go to Asia, and they all want to know about rip trills. That, that's something they, they seem to want to know about. And then they want to know how I can play so loud because I'm so small. And I say, <laughs> look at Gail. <laughs> she can play even louder, and she's even smaller. Um, but um, what about your students? Is there a particular thing that challenges them? Um, I would say they're all worried about playing Shostakovich 5. <laughs> yeah, with a good sound. Yeah. Um, and, and I can pick on my students. I don't think they know. I, I can say this basically, I think, for most students. And this could be really not nice to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think they don't have the patience because the computer is so fast. Mm -hmm. And everything has come immediate. 
that that's what I can say that I'm so thankful I grew up on a farm because you had to go work yeah. and things take a long time you plant the seed and it has to be watered and it has to be weeded and then you get to have to reap the fruits later but it takes a long time and I think that's very hard for the youth today because everything is so fast and I can be you know I, I can certainly be proven wrong but I think the consistent practice they just don't realize how many hours it really takes and you know when I was in college I didn't have TV I didn't have a computer we didn't have computers and they kinda laugh at that but that's the way it was so my entertainment was to sit down with my LP and a score and I played through all eight horn parts of Helmleben that was my Saturday night entertainment cool love it <laughs> I, but that's they don't do that how many students actually sit down and play along now and it's pretty easy with all the YouTube and all the parts you can have. Yeah. And you can, you, it's all the, yeah. Yeah, it's all out there. Right. No, it's very, very important point. I mean, uh, this sort of locking yourself away for hours in a practice room, um, you know, without your iPhone, without your computer. We were wondering the other day how we even lasted in rehearsals without iPhones, but uh, uh, <laughs> not supposed to say that online. I have, to, I have to ask you, is it really true that if, uh, someone's phone goes off in a rehearsal, is it a 50 euro fine? It is absolutely true. Yeah, they absolutely think true. know that. Yeah. No, it's true. And the best one was recently in a Bruckner symphony. It was a slow movement. It was a really peaceful part where all the winds were being quiet. It wasn't in the concert, it was in rehearsal. And we were just sitting there minding our own business and we heard <laughs> one of the clarinets died <coughs> from his phone. That was one of the best moments having a cow in the middle of Bruckner Symphony. So yeah, he had to pay. So it really, really is, really is true. Yeah, yeah. We have so many questions. We're never going to get through them. Hey, you guys, if you have a question, I, I can't see all the chat as it comes. I can see it, but then when Gail's some, saying something interesting, I can't. Your, yours, your, your question sort of disappears. So if there's anything you really want to keep writing it, and then I'll see it. I know I saw a couple about the air difference in the low and the high range. That's something I wanted to ask you anyway. So keep the questions coming, even if you've asked already, because maybe I've seen it and I've missed it out. Gail, air. Um, in the low range and the high range, how can we picture this differently? Do we need to speed it up? Do we need to slow it down? Um, I always think of a canal of water. And as you get, it's the same amount. As you get, you let the canal open up, it gets thicker. And then you go fast again. And then it goes out. So it's like a river, and, you, and it depends on how wide the banks are. And if you want to speed it up, you speed it up to go up around the corner and then you thicken it back out again and slow it up. So sort of like rapids, I guess, if you can think that. But you, right. that's what I always think. You have to go faster around that corner. Or, you know, if you were riding a bike and you start going down the hill, you can feel that speed. And then you start going around the corner, you got to shift the, the weight again. It's, a, it's sort of the same thing. A little we're strange. Skipping, we're skipping around a little bit now. Um, in, in the, in the, this is like 20 questions, so we're not sort of staying on the same chapter all the time. Um, Bree and Robert both asked the same things. What would you recommend to a student trying to recover endurance and range after a, a lip injury? Poor things. I don't know if you mean a lip injury, a punch in the face, or a lip injury from practicing too much, or from a Mahler symphony. But I guess yeah, it's more that, or less. That, that depends on what it is, actually. Yeah. yeah if it's yeah. a real true injury from uh, playing injury too much, mm -hmm. or even if you get hit. I mean, I one time got um, hit in the face uh, just playing with my son. You know, we were just fooling around in, in Lake Michigan, and I got hit. And ooh, ooh. So I called my horn teacher, and he said, "Popsicles. Popsicles. They're round." It was perfect. It, it just kept it nice and cool, kept the swelling down, and you wait, you know. Popsicles, you, popsicles are called ice lollies where I come from. Okay. Just to give some British people out there, ice lollies. But I, I think you have to treat it like if you sprain your ankle, would you go yeah. run a 5K? No. No, that's, no exactly. So, and, and, and people with endurance problems, okay, um, <clears throat> You want to play this? Well, okay, let's put it to running. Have you have you run a 5K? No. Then you can't go out and run a 10K, exactly. et cetera, et cetera. And I really always refer it to 
some kind of athletic event because I think that's easier for them to kind of you know understand that these are small muscles and they're got, they need to be repaired. That's the same thing. The person who asked Robert just said it was overuse of torn lip muscles, so that must have been a lot of pressure going on there. Um, so that that I hope really helps you, Robert, um, because it's absolutely true what she says. If it hurts, leave it alone. <laughs> <clears throat> also, I think sometimes that when you start feeling a pain, you start pressing or you try to squeeze so much instead of using the corners and good air. It's yeah. really basic. Down, it's down to the good air bit again, I think. We try and we try here, quite, oh, my section, we always try to push it off the lip a little bit. You know, we keep the corners and we try and cushion. I see Stefan Dorr doing this all the time. It's yes. something I learned from him when I came here to take, because I mean, the pressure, the, the stuff we have to play in this, the, the the, the, the dynamics we have to play mm -hmm. here. So instead of doing that, which a lot of people do, right. we go it in. Yeah. like that. Yeah. And, uh, and that really helps too, especially after an, uh, maybe a lip injury and that sort of, yeah. Right. Someone said, what's, what, Rebecca, what's the best way to maintain an open tone near the end of a concert when it's starting to hurt? <laughs> well, um, I, I will only say this, that I think of this always. Um, one time, Mr. Clevenger hurt his back on tour. I got off the bus. I was handed first horn for Mahler 5. And no rehearsal, yeah. no assistant, play it tonight. And I thought, oh, shoot, I'm not going to get my bike ride in, you know? Because I was in San Diego, and I really wanted to go to the zoo. But I wasn't yeah. going to get to do that. And so I was backstage. Um... Mr. Schulte says, oh, my dear, we will have so much fun tonight. I'm thinking, yeah, right. So Mr. Herseth came up to me and said, now, are you playing the Haydn Symphony? I said, yes, I'm going to play the Haydn Symphony. He said, good. He said, and when you start getting tired in that Mahler Symphony, blow that mouthpiece off your face. And I think of it every t all the time. I did a recital yesterday, and I was thinking that at the end, blow that mouthpiece off your face because you... You, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. That you're not thinking, oh crap, I'm getting tired, and you go in, you're going actually the opposite direction. Great advice, Gail. This is, this is just amazing. I mean, we could go on for hours. I, I, I really don't want to don't want to, you've got to work, and I'm thinking of Tim in Melbourne, he has to edit all this, and Jakob's hand's almost falling off again. Um, Jakob's not a horn player, he's filming for me, he's learning all this amazing stuff about horns, so you're going to have a test at the end of all these. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, is quite, this is quite interesting, because I have the same problem. Jeremy asks, what's a good exercise to avoid excess back pressure with, when you're using the airstream? People, I breathe a lot into the back because I haven't got much other space to breathe into. Um, I know Mary Louisa breathes into the back. Stefan uses a lot of a lot of back breath. I, I mean, I assume you do too. Where 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 you put it? Um, how can it, how can you avoid that that tension? Actually, there shouldn't be that tension in your, in your back if you're breathing properly. Now, my first question to him would be: uh, How many back extensions at the gym do you do every day? Okay, good question. I mean, you have to build up those muscles. Those muscles go all the way around. They're not just in the front. They're all the way around, so those muscles have to be toned. And if you have all of your muscles toned all the way around your whole abdomen, to your, you know, all the way around, you're going to have more success. Gail, I could go on for hours. We're going to have you back on, I think. This yeah. is really, it's, I mean, I learned so much here, too. But I think there's just one, I've had a question from Tim in Melbourne, who we both know and love. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just an indication that he's a tuba player, so he's want, and maybe he wants us to get all off this horn nerd stuff, which we love. He wants to hear your dog sing. He wants to hear my dog sing. Well, yesterday in my, my recital, I did the Chicago premiere of a new sonata that James Stevenson wrote. And my dog Riley is, he, when I was getting ready to play long call, I could play the third no, first note and he would start howling no matter where he was in the house. And so the other night he wasn't ramped up, really, really ready to go. So if I can get this to go, I hope this will work. Does he only do it with this piece or does he do it in general when you, when you practice? I can get him to do it almost any time if I play stop torn. 
Yeah, that's but, the same. Yeah, we have the same here with lucky but stuff. This, this one is pretty spectacular because if you keep counting it, one, two, one, two, you realize that he has very good rhythm besides almost good pitch. So here we go. So guys, you're going to hear Gail's dog singing. Here we go. He's he's really and he, I'm I'm sitting on my exercise ball, and he's doing this behind me. So it's a wonder I have not fallen off. You know? Can you can you can you film this maybe sometime and send it to us? We'd love to. Put I it hope up I can. Yeah, that takes a little coordination for me up there. You know. Just get just get Larry to to press record on your iPhone and send it to Tim. We'll put it up with the interview. I really okay. I've got to do this. <laughs> Listen, you're you're just you're really amazing. What you're doing for chamber horn chamber music, you've commissioned all these pieces. I mean, it's a sort of real thing of yours, isn't it? Yeah, I, I love it. And in February, I'm going to premiere a new violin horn piano trio that you'll want to know about too. Is by David wow. Sampson. Yeah, it's a Great. really spectacular piece. Fantastic. Yeah. Ah, good. You sh you need to make a catalog of, of Gail's pieces for horn. We need to yeah. get that out there. Well, yeah. maybe well, someday. Well, We'll, 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 we'll talk about that. There's all sorts of things planned online, and I, I would love you to be a part of it, and everybody out there would Let too. me know. I think there we need to have a teacher's forum online. This is in the works. We've got some really great ideas, and there's Jeff and Tim sitting in Melbourne, and they're cooking up things up while we speak. But I'll be back online, and I hope all you guys will be out back online with us. We'll definitely have Gail back sometime soon. And, um, yeah, Gail, what can I say? You're a superstar. Thank you for having me. So I'm much. glad you're here today. Yeah, if so are we. We loved the echoes last time, though. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Uh, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. See you guys next time. Uh -huh.